Shalom and welcome to Editor's Note. I'm Eir Pinto, and together with me, as always, is TV7 Israel Editor-in-Chief Jonathan Hassan. How are you doing today? Doing well, praise the Lord. How about yourself? I'm doing great, and uh, Jerusalem is now becoming very nice, a little bit cooler, so it's good to change from, you know, very hot to very nice in the evenings. The weather conditions are <laughs> indeed uh, among the best in the country, I would say, mm-hmm. uh, even northern Israel, even though northern Israel is somewhat greener and there's more water and there's more uh, life from that matter, uh, from that aspect. Here in Jerusalem, as Jerusalemites who were born here, obviously, uh, I wouldn't change it in, with any place in this world. Definitely. You know, it's really nice that uh, in the evening you have this cool Jerusalem breeze. Mm. As you walk around, it's really cool. No humidity. <laughs> Definitely. Yeah. Okay, I think we, we can start, uh, as we always do, with uh, prayer. And this time I would also like to pray for one of uh, our viewers who sent us an email updating us that his mother passed on to be with the Lord. So uh, we really also want to bless the family and ask for encouragement so everybody back at home, if you could please join me in prayer. Uh, his name is Ryan, and we'd like to encourage him, his family, and pray for them. And also for the whole TV7 family, obviously. We all are dealing mm-hmm. with challenges, with uh, joyful moments, with less so. We yeah. should uh, pray for each other and encourage each other. Daily. Yeah, definitely. We really encourage everybody to send us uh, comments, emails, to share what you're going through, because this is uh, how we can get through things together. So, hallelujah. Avinu sheba shamayim, toda lecha shata itano, toda lecha shata sholet. Our Father in heaven, thank you that you're with us. Thank you that you're in control. Thank you that you uh, have a plan and you know uh, what you want to do with our lives. We pray for uh, encouragement for Ryan and his family. We pray for all of the family of TV7 all over the world, that you will encourage them, bless them, help us really support each other in whatever we can do. We pray for the team here in Jerusalem. We pray that you will lead us forward to the goals that you want us to reach, that you will be with us today in the show, that you will speak through us to the people and everybody back at home and that you will touch their hearts and our hearts. We pray for Jonathan, we pray for myself and for the rest of the team behind the scenes and for everybody who's watching us. We pray for a happy new year, Shana Tova, for everybody around the world and Israel. Amen. Amen. So Jonathan, Rosh Shana Sameach. Indeed, happy new year, uh, year 5,783. It's, it's been quite a time since uh, Adam and Adam Eve. Adam and Eve, yeah. It's really uh, interesting who this calculated world. these, num- these uh, numbers. It is indeed, nevertheless, that's not what's <laughs> trivial, obviously. The, the fact of the matter is uh, it is accounting of the Hebrew calendar mm-hmm. uh, based on Uh, the historical events that took place in the Bible from the moment of creation uh, and until the moment uh, we are living in. So obviously this is one of the two official calendars in Israel, keeping the Hebrew calendar and, of course, also specifically the Gregorian calendar uh, to align ourselves with the rest of the world. Pretty much the West, but yes, the the rest of the world. Yes, yes. Yeah, but, uh, well, I think this is just a few words about Rosh Hashanah. It's very important to remember. It's also called the Feast of Trumpets. And we believe that in this time, God is calling us and reminding us, you know, actually reminding us with horns and with trumpets uh, to repent and to get back to Him and to soul search from now until Yom Kippur, the Day of Atonement. And as we always say, Every day we should repent because we know that, you know, God died for us and we have the option to clear our hearts from sin with the blood of Jesus. But this is nice that, you know, we have traditions and uh, certain times in the year that are meant for soul searching and repenting. Indeed. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. Um, You know, you you started your prayer with hallelujah. Uh, I, I very much enjoy the Hebrew language and the point where many names, many references 
are always a connection between God, the holy name of God, mm -hmm. Adonai Yehova. Uh, so Hallelu from Hallel, praise. Mm -hmm. Hallelu is to praise it, the mm -hmm. Adonai. Yeah. God. Okay, yeah. So Hallelujah. Oh. Obviously, you're aware of this, but I think that it's uh, special for uh, our TV7 family to understand that many of those uh, words in, in, uh, or names in, in Hebrew, as I said in the last program about Mori, Yah, my mm -hmm. teacher is Yah, my name, Yonatan, Yehonatan, yeah. okay, is also uh, the name, God gave. God gave, definitely. Yah gave, okay, so... It goes on and on and on and on and on. Uh, and uh, even Yair. <laughs> yeah, with light. Yeah. Yair is to light, but with always the first letter of the reference of God. So God will light. Mm -hmm. So uh, there is much of that. And, and <laughs> it's uh, quite uh, interesting to hear when we're obviously abroad and people are using Hebrew references, uh, sometimes the context Mm -hmm. uh, is not completely understood um, and sometimes even taken out of context. But oh, that's a different story. Definitely. One, one name that we must, you know, share the meaning in Hebrew is Yeshua, which means salvation yeah. in Hebrew. So this is like, I think... Yeshua means salvation, yeah. literally. Yeah, indeed. that's it. And uh, beyond that also, uh, of course, we hear uh, Adonai Rafa. Yeah, God, our healer. Uh, Le rappe is to heal. So Adonai Rafa is, is God, uh, is our healer. Uh, again, <laughs> Definitely. We'll, one day we'll be able to, with God's grace, uh, launch a program to teach Hebrew and to provide all those nuances so people can relate mm -hmm. when they read. Even in the Bible, there are a lot of references that you read and you tell yourself, oh, wow, this means this. And then you hear an entire preaching that takes it completely out of context only because those Hebrew references are not exactly. understood. Exactly. So exactly. It, it's unfortunate, but, you know, uh, we, we're working to clarify the matters and uh, with God's grace, as TFTN uh, highlights in, in uh, its uh, motto, for from Zion will come forth the law and the word of the Lord from Jerusalem. We're here in Jerusalem. We're working to uh, realize that even though that is for the future Jerusalem, we still believe that we can partake in initiating this process. Definitely. Okay, so we had a very eventful week last week and I just wanted to thank God for really being with us. We had a cyber attack on our servers here in Jerusalem last week. And uh, thank God our team together here in Jerusalem and in Finland were able to figure it out and everything is back to normal and Israel News will continue on a daily basis and all glory goes to the Lord. Amen. Keep, keep going. <laughs> yeah, it was a little challenging, but yeah. nevertheless, you know, it's, it's good to remain vigilant, mm -hmm. especially mm -hmm. in the cyber sphere. Just uh, today, well, today, last week, and, and uh, it, it's becoming worse and worse. Uh, the number of cyber attacks, mm -hmm. the tool cyber is being utilized by nations uh, that don't need any more to fire shots to make a point. Exactly. And that's why we see less attacks, kinetic attacks, but we see a lot more cyber attacks on a regular basis. Iran is attacking Israel significantly. Uh, other terror organizations are also doing so. Obviously, Israel retaliates and has quite the capabilities being uh, according to different uh, research mm -hmm. assessments, uh, research institute assessments, on this particularly, is, is Israel is in the top five. Mm -hmm. uh, Iran is not far behind, by the way. Really? Uh, okay. Nevertheless, Iran has less infrastructure integrated into the cybersphere, so it is less vulnerable when we're talking about that because ah, it has less capacity less connected defense. to it. Right. Okay, got it. Not less defense, it has less... Um, uh, so Israel, almost everything is connected to the cybersphere. I In see. Iran, not everything is connected to the cybersphere. That, I that's see. The point. Some things are analog. Indeed. Okay. So, as you said, last week was very intensive. Uh, many events from the UN um, General Assembly starting, uh, and uh, uh, we heard the speeches from um, the E3, the three uh, 
important members of, mm-hmm. of the European uh, continent, uh, including Britain, France, and Germany. Mm-hmm. We heard uh, the the United States, the the president, of course, uh, Canada, and and. Uh, the leader of the Islamic Republic of Iran and the leader of Qatar and the leader of Israel. And we're seeing more and more of this uh, taking a uh, form of each one coming and voicing their uh, perspective, what they want to put on the global agenda. Uh, quite interestingly, uh, while Emmanuel Macron just said one sentence about Iran's nuclear program, literally one sentence, and he, in this sentence, he also put it in context about non-proliferation, Iran and North Korea. Mm-hmm. Uh, Olaf Schultz didn't say anything about it. Um, Joe Biden did speak about it. Okay, okay. not at length, quite short, but he did speak about it. And then uh, the two major um, entities or countries that communicated about this obviously was the Islamic Republic of Iran and Israel. In Israel, yes. Mm-hmm. There is uh, an exchange of threats currently taking place. While Yair yeah, Lapid was speaking at the U- uh, UN General Assembly, mm-hmm. in Israel, Defense Minister Benny Gantz was making his remarks about Israel will not accept, and we spoke about it last week in the news, will not accept Iranian threats against its vital infrastructure, neither would it accept it those threats via its proxies, mm-hmm. in reference to Hezbollah, with uh, specifically Hassan Nasrallah, the Director General or Secretary General of uh, Hezbollah, uh, who is a member of this Islamic revolutionary regime. Mm-hmm. He came out and said, unless Israel and Lebanon reach a conclusion about the delineation of a maritime border between the two countries that would settle a long dispute of many years and then uh, would uh, bring about ultimately the capacity of Lebanon to start um, exploiting its natural resources in the eastern Mediterranean. Israel would have the capacity to exploit further its Mm -hmm. resources to the point of agreement. The uh, organization Hezbollah said, okay, even though there is progress, which it's uh, mediated by the United States, uh, Hochstein, uh, an American emissary of of the Biden administration, is doing actually a very good job in this aspect after years of of disagreements. We're talking about the the Karish, the the gas resource. The offshore gas rig Uh from which uh, Israel intends to start pretty soon yeah you know, so it starts operating and extracting gas from that rig uh, in the beginning of October okay there was a technical delay there was some cynical political use of this um, issue with uh, obviously election times going back and forth uh, this is obviously noise there there is an ongoing, dialogue with the Americans, there's a discussion about de-escalation, trying to ensure that there's not going to break out a war. Mm -hmm. Nevertheless, there are people uh, within the the defense establishment, within the strategic thinkers that hope, uh, unfortunately, they hope, that Hezbollah would make that miscalculation and attack uh, Israel in one way or another and grant Israel the legitimacy to destroy them. Uh-huh. Uh, the reason for that is, mm-hmm. ultimately, if we look at the broader context, okay, and, and obviously nobody wants war. We don't want war with Lebanon. But Hezbollah is an extension of Iran. It, it's not a, a separate entity that operates at Iran's behest. No, it's an extension thereof. It operates in Syria. Its advisors are going around with the Quds Force advisors of the mm-hmm. Islamic Revolutionary Guards, advising the various entities in uh, or terror organizations in Syria, in Iraq, with Hashd al-Shabi, Qatayb Hezbollah, and so on. It, you see the Lebanese Hezbollah also in Yemen, teaching them how to utilize drones, how to utilize uh, all the various uh, aspects of, of 
uh, offensive capabilities against Iranian interests. So it, it is very active on a regional scale, even on a global scale. Uh -huh. Hezbollah is considered to be the number one, and the United States has it designated as such, the number one um, a drug smuggler including in cooperation with all the cartels in South America. Really? So Hezbollah is very That's strong. how they get their money, or a, a big bunch of it? Uh, quite the significant uh, amounts of Hezbollah are drug money. By the way, Iran as well. All okay. right, there, there are a lot of uh, things happening there. Iran is utilizing not only uh, its uh, capacity to smuggle, it smuggles other things as well, including weapons and, and oil and, and many other things to try and circumvent, obviously, the sanctions imposed by the UN Security Council, but also by the United States, by other countries around the world. The situation is currently in the position where it is very tense. Hezbollah is in cooperation with the Iranians, trying to threaten Israel and and thwart its day-to-day -day life. Mm -hmm. Israel reacts. It's not, it's reactionary, but it's also initiating. Okay, so there are two angles to this. Mm -hmm. Usually, we're currently, as you started the program with Rosh Hashanah, yes. we're usually in a period of heightened tensions. Because of the high holidays. Because of the high holidays, were in past times, the, the military establishment, the defense establishment, is lowering its profile. It's securing uh, the, the, the borders, borders, the security fences, and so on, establishes blockades, but allows those um, enemies of Israel or the, the various uh, entities that seek to harm Israel to, to um, operate without threat. Mm -hmm. okay? This is not the case currently. Operation Waves Breaker is still ongoing. Six months ago, it was initiated, and it's still ongoing. It's it's been a while. Every day, mm -hmm. every day, we we record all the uh, uh, arrests made by uh, the Israeli defense establishment, the, the various entities thereof. We see between five, eight, to twenty terrorists being apprehended on a daily basis for wow. six months. And this More is in, in Judea and Samaria. Oh, uh, this actually occurs mostly in the northern part of Judea and Samaria in two towns, Nablus, Janine, mm -hmm. where the Palestinian Authority has lost control completely. The Palestinian Authority really? is not really able to enter those areas. So yeah. its intelligence apparatus tried to enter and, and to arrest a, a member, a senior member of the Islamist Hamas organization. They engaged with those terrorists, Palestinian Islamic Jihad, mm -hmm. Hamas, and all kind of other entities. They engaged with them in gun battles over and over and over again. Palestinians against Palestinians. Yes. Now, uh, we need to give the Palestinian Authority credit and Israel's defense ministry credit for enabling the Palestinian Authority to do so in the southern part of the West Bank. Okay, you have Samaria to the north, Judea mm -hmm. to the south, Jordan River to the east. The southern part, we see more and more the Palestinian Authority active in a vigorous crackdown on Hamas and Palestinian Islamic Jihad. Okay, those two entities, they are. Um, not only dangerous to Israel, they're dangerous to the Palestinian Authority. Yes, we see what they happened the in the Gaza Strip. Correct. Mm -hmm. Now, uh, it comes also with pressure from Europe, it comes with pressure from the United States on the Palestinian Authority because, also by the way, from Canada. Canada okay. is very active in training those Palestinian security forces. Mm -hmm. Uh, and uh, so is Sweden, so is, uh, you have the Netherlands, uh, different uh, countries, it's called uh, EUCOP, uh, the, the European Union's uh, co uh, police, police. Uh, you know, um, system. It's been ongoing for 10 years, 11 years about. Uh, unfortunately, it's not really been very successful. So they're but training they're the Palestinian rest. Authority because they are the legitimate 
leaders of the Palestinian people. So they're backed by Europe. They're they are by... the ones that, uh, you know what, we'll get to there in okay. a couple of minutes. Uh, we don't have very much time, so I want to uh, close this angle. One of the reasons Israel really activate, continues to actively pursue every terror element in the West Bank, in the northern part, because Iran has invested significant funds into this. Mm -hmm. So what has happened, uh, Israel is now on quite understanding that if there is a war vis-a-vis -vis Hezbollah in the north and the Shiite organizations in Syria potentially joining the fight, this would mean that Iran would try to activate Palestinian Islamic Jihad in Gaza mm -hmm. and Palestinian Islamic Jihad in the West Bank. Now, breaking dawn, a weekend of battles specifically against Palestinian Islamic Jihad. Hamas was taken uh, put to the side. Why? Turkey influenced. Mm -hmm. Qatar influenced. They don't very much care about Iranian aspirations against Israel. They care about their own interests. Mm -hmm. So Hamas was left be, uh, at the sidelines, which not to forget, even though Hamas is an enemy, it's an offshoot of the Muslim Brotherhood, even though it's supported by Iran, fiscally and logistically and training wise, uh, the component within Hamas that is supported by Iran is not necessarily the strongest component. So there are different streams within Hamas, okay, mm -hmm. supported by different countries. Now, Palestinian Islamic Jihad is 100% an Iranian proxy, receives the directives from Iran. So breaking down that weekend diminished its power in Gaza. I see. The operation Ways Breaker diminishes Iranian capacity to uh, raise up those 2,000 and even more of terror suspects, terror elements, who were able to, they were armed to the teeth, able to pick up weapons and to start a full-fledged uprising, uh, attacking Israeli settlements in a very high volume. So what we're seeing now, mm. we're seeing terrorist attacks, yes, but it's such a small volume, thank God. Um, with a low count of casualties, injuries, primarily in, in a light form. Uh, nevertheless, there are, uh, you know, it, it's a reactionary battle. So uh, settlements are being attacked. You'll start seeing more snipers on the rooftops in certain areas. Mm -hmm. Okay. And the moment the snipers are there, they will wait for those people. The moment uh, the very sophisticated algorithms understand the the patterns of those terrorists what they do how they do it and even though the terrorists are not comprehending this the the security establishment the intelligence establishment yeah. knows exactly what is their next move going to be after several times and they're going to deal with this uh surgically with the utmost um attempts to avoid collateral damage to avoid uh, too much pressure on the society at large and to enable the society to live in in dignity with mm -hmm. uh, economic benefits to it, obviously, because most people just want to live. They don't want war. Yeah, also definitely. in the Palestinian side. Let, let's put this in perspective. Now, we don't have, again, much time <laughs> left, but one of the things that we need to understand, and this was also at um, the UN the speech of, of Yair Lapid, obviously he spoke about a two-state solution. Mm -hmm. Let me tell um, all of the people watching us right now, even though he claims to support a two-state solution and might see this as the most viable option, obviously there are two aspects to this, uh, but it's more complicated than that. A two-state solution is in order to secure a Jewish majority in the land, there is a keen... Um, school of thought here in Israel that we need to separate from the Palestinians in order to ensure a demographic majority to the Jewish people. Mm -hmm. Because uh, you cannot maintain a democratic society and not have demographic majority. numbers, yes. which ultimately would uh, mean that if you make a one state within a democratic society, you would lose the majority and you lose the premiership. Suddenly you have a prime minister who is 
a Palestinian. Yeah, because Only they have, have more a, people. Yeah, if they establish a coalition, they can become prime ministers. And then they can change the rules, change they the laws. change everything, everything. and uh, you can say goodbye to a Jewish state. Th exactly. This is the, the mindset behind the so-called left. It's not only a so-called left, but it is uh, a part of the left. There are others within the left, by the way, who do not believe in a two-state solution. They believe in a one-state solution for all its citizens. Yeah. Okay. Uh, others believe, so uh, there are different types of schools of thought about how to resolve the issue. Honestly, um, God bless our leaders that they mm -hmm. need to figure out a way to deal with this because this is not an easy way. Yeah. Um, there is uh, no one easy solution to this. No, uh, no. And maintaining the land as it is, is going to be an explosive keg. This mm -hmm. is something everybody agrees also, uh, from my assessment, the security, uh, aspects of, of the situation um, is going to be quite difficult. Now, very quickly, who was the only prime minister in recent history, okay, who rejected a two-state solution? Tell us. Since Rabin. By the way, Rabin, mm -hmm. it's like Rabin who was murdered, who passed the Oslo Accords, in the Oslo Accords, against what people claim, there is no two-state solution. Okay, this this is something that the Bush administration mm -hmm. actually promoted first time. Rabin would not have accepted a two-state solution. Everybody agrees right and left. Yeah. Okay, he, he believed in a Jewish state next to a Palestinian entity, and this is also what the Oslo Accords say. I see. Netanyahu supports a two-state solution. He mm -hmm. had his famous Bar Ilan speech. Yeah declared it multiple times. The fact that he uh, said it doesn't necessarily mean that he actually believes it, but that's a different story. We're dealing with politicians politics, here. Yeah. The only one who didn't speak about a two-state solution is Naftali Bennett. Okay. And he's the only one who didn't have a majority of mandates to lead any coalition. The next time around, we're going to discuss two more angles that are quite significant. Uh, the one is the Russian angle, obviously mm -hmm. the conscription. There is discussions about a million troops. Let's see. I, I haven't read the, the secret clause, so I don't know. The second thing, obviously, Queen Elizabeth uh, passed on. Uh, it was quite a significant uh, mark in history, mm -hmm. for that matter. But this obviously in, in our next program. Thank you, Jonathan. This is all the time that we have for today. And thank you to our extended family back home. I wish you a Shana Tova, Rosh Hashanah Sameach, and we'll see you next time for another episode of Editor's Note. TV7 Israel invites you to watch and hear some of the most knowledgeable experts, most of whom are took in creating policies shaping this region today. Join us for Jerusalem Studio.